Welcome. We um, have Warrnambool Library here presenting Maya Linnell, <clears throat> excuse me, and she's going to talk to us all about her second novel, Bottle Brush Creek. Maya was recently shortlisted in the ARA 2019 Favourite Australian Romance Author, Favourite Debut Author and Favourite Small Town Romance for her best selling rural romance debut, Wildflower Ridge. Her second novel, which we'll be talking about tonight, is Bottle Brush Creek. And both stories have gathered inspiration from her rural upbringing and the small communities that she has lived in and loved. Now, Maya is a former country journalist and PR writer, but um, her bio says she now prefers the world of fiction over fact and blogs for Romance Writers Australia. Sounds like, and I've seen your Facebook page, you do bake up a storm. You're an, <laughs> an amazing chef by the looks of it. Um, you've got a beautiful garden and I've seen beautiful little lambs and lovely little photos all over your Facebook page. And you've got three kids as well. So obviously you're great with time management. And um, you live on a farm, very small, pro a small property, not far, from, how many k's from Warrnambool? Uh, we're at Narrawong, so we're a good 45 minute drive. Yeah, beautiful. And um, it does mention you've got a menagerie of farm animals and the odd snake or two. That's right, Jane. Uh, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. It's great to be here with Warrnambool Libraries. Um, being a, a pretty much a local, it is uh, really nice to be able to chat to people about my books. And yes, we do have the odd snake or two. We've had about four this year. So our average is, um, seems to be about four a year. We've got uh, quite a swampy bit down the bottom of our paddock and uh, the snakes love it. So we're always keeping our eyes peeled. We're in the garden with the kids are out and about, with the sheep, with the cows, with the pigs, uh, just making sure where we step is not got a snake underneath it. Yes, I will give you um, plenty of um, fodder being on the land. Now, um, I've just had a look at one of um, a couple of your reviews. Um, New Idea magazine, you'll devour this rural read in one go, which is great because at the moment, sometimes people may have thought, oh, you know, what am I going to do? But yes, pick up a book because we would love you to pick up a book, particular Mayers. <laughs> Um, but it says you'll devour this rural read in one go. So a great, easy read. We don't want anything too technical and heavy, something that we can just smash out in a day or two. If, get on the couch, <laughs> sit back and, and um, enjoy it. I also saw um, another quote was, a sparkling entry into the rural romance arena. And um, Kim from Goodreads, I lost myself in Wildflower Ridge. A beautiful novel, full of love, fun, excitement, cooking and country flair. So you've got a whole package going there. Um, I'm going to um, just flip over here. So you've, I've had a little look at the summary or synopsis of Bottle Brush Creek. Um, so we're talking this time, um, one of the sisters, this time Angie. And she has a little girl, Claudia, who's two years old. And she has her fly out, fly in husband, FIFO worker, Rob. Um, and it's the whole story about them looking for the perfect fixer upper, finding the perfect location. Then the dilemma of it just happens to be next to his parents' place and then <laughs> how that journey goes. So do you want to just take us through um, Bottle Brush Creek? Yeah, thank you, Jane. So when I decided to write my second novel, I thought now, I, I, knew, I knew that I wanted to focus on another McIntyre sister because for anyone who's read my first novel, uh, Wildflower Ridge, will know that it's about Penny McIntyre and her journey back to the family farm. And for Angie McIntyre, she was one of my favourite characters to write in the first book. So I thought, well, she was a natural choice for who I would choose to focus on. Um, and Angie's a beautician. She loves her family, loves her baking. Um, and right at the end of Wildflower Ridge, she finds herself unexpectedly pregnant. Now, that was a storyline that got edited out 
right at the final stages of um, editing Wildflower Ridge because it was already a bit of a busy book at the end of it. So, but in my head, I'd already gone ahead and um, I guess um, developed this whole life for Angie and what her second book would be about. So I wanted to come into the story with uh, Angie and her daughter, Claudia. Her partner, Rob, is fly in, fly out. And as you said, Jane, one of the little dilemmas that they face is when they're searching for the perfect little property to bring their little family together, one of the things they find is it is right next door to Rob's family. And they have a dairy farm in, set in southwest Victoria. I've given it a fictional name of Port Fairview, but anyone who picks up the book and reads it that's from our local region or that's been down here before will know pretty clearly that I've based it on Port Fairy. And I have a lot of love for Port Fairy and I thought it was the perfect little spot to, to set the book. There's plenty of different dramas that Angie and Rob face throughout the story. They've got troublesome tradies. They've got the meddling mother-in-law. They've got community volunteerism, uh, people knocking on the door for all the different um, committees that they'd like help with. And there's the friendship dilemmas of whether you get your friends to help out with renovations or whether you outsource it or whether you try and do it yourself. Uh, so there's lots of little things in there and we've got animals and we've got baking and we've got gardening as well. So I really thought I'd throw a lot of different things I liked into this story and uh, it, it's been a lot of fun writing it. That's wonderful. So with um, Angie, she obviously sounds, you know, a, a very busy woman um, as, as <laughs> most ladies are. Time management, you know, she's juggling so many things. How did you find um, a flow of choosing what path she would take up in the book? Of Because there were so many different things. She's got the dairy, she's got the child. It says um, here, um, I think she had a beauty salon. As you say, there's the, the committees, the in-laws are next door. So it's all about juggling. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're right, Jane. I think you've hit the nail on the head that, um, you know, I don't know a single another woman that's not juggling multiple balls at the one time. And I think it's something that um, mums do really successfully. You know, you have one hand rocking the pram, the other one on the phone to Optus complaining about your service. You'll have something cooking that you need to, you know, leave the pram to stir something. And, you know, we, we manage to get ourselves into these situations where there's a lot being done for other people, but not necessarily things being done for ourselves. So, so poor Angie in this rural romance, she has got a lot of different things being thrown at her. And, and it was fun trying to choose which of those different threads got picked up. At one stage of the book, um, in the first draft, I had her opening up a whole new beauty salon in Port Ferry, right along that river, on that beautiful riverfront where there's a fish and chip shop. I had her starting a new salon there. And I just thought, hold on, she can't do everything. Like I, I need to obviously make her realistic. So we can't completely burden her with all these different things. So I, I had, um, it's probably, you know, 20, 30,000 words of story that I wrote that didn't end up in the final version. And it's little plot points like that that I just had to kind of pull back on and remember what my main story was, which was it's a rural romance. It's got Angie, it's got Rob, it's got the renovation and the tradesmen and the in-laws with the dairy next door. So it was, um, it, it is tricky to try and pick and choose your plot lines, but I think it worked out okay. Right. Now, um, Rob, give us a little bit of a background on Rob. Yeah, so Rob is also referred to as Jonesy throughout the book. Um, so his name is Rob Jones and he's the son of two dairy farmers, Rosa and John. Now, he doesn't have a lot of time for his dad. There was a rift earlier in, this, uh, in their, his teenage years that we don't talk about too much. You don't get the full lowdown on that until a fair bit later in the book. But another thing that we find out about Rob is that he has a twin brother and his twin brother, Max, is off the scene. So Angie's never met him. She hardly ever hears about him. But it's not until they move back to his hometown that little whispers about about Max and about their relationship at Rob and Max and why they don't speak to each other, why Max is off traveling the globe, um, start to come to her in little spits and spats. And we also have um, Rob's relationship with his mum. He's very close to Rosa, but of course, uh, because he's flying and fly out and he works over in Western Australia on a mine site, comes back for several weeks at a time and then he's away for a bit. 
you know, his relationship or, and his little family's relationship with his mum and dad is, is a bit different perhaps to when they're living right next door to each other. So I wanted to explore that. We've got, um, he never wanted to be a dairy farmer. That was not on his list of things to do after seeing his parents slog it in day in, day out um, with the early starts and the, that commitment that, of course, when you're milking cows, you have to have that 100% commitment to the job. Um, he collects vintage motorbikes and that was a really fun little uh, hobby to give him because my dad has this fantastic shed full of um, many motorbikes of all different varieties and I've just plucked a couple of ones that were really special to me when I was growing up um, and the bikes that I loved and remembered. We've got a Harley Davidson with a sidecar that's painted black and gold just like my dad's one and and there's an old Indian motorbike from, um, I think it's 1945 or something around there. I'd have to check with dad. <clears throat> and I, I wanted to give Rob those bikes because to me, you know, it's, it's really special. To someone else, it could have been um, a BSA, it could have been a Kawasaki, it could have been a Buell. But I wanted to choose those bikes that were special to me. And, and I tell you what, it's really nice to, um, to watch um, different people who have an interest in motorbikes, particularly vintage motorbikes talk about how they really quite like that little subplot. So I, I enjoy throwing all those different little parts into make up Rob and, and the man that he is. Yeah. So um, without giving too much away, are we going to see Rob tinkering more with the motorbikes and less with doing the jobs on the farm when he is back home <laughs> from his work? Well, look, anyone who has a motorbike or whose partner has a motorbike knows that they're a bit addictive. And uh, you can spend a heck of a lot of time chasing parts, looking at other bikes, thinking about ways that you can repaint it. And of course, they break down a heck of a lot too. So um, yes, there certainly is the motorbike factor. It is a bit of a conflict between Angie and Rob at some stages in the book. Uh-huh. And Angie, how does she juggle Rob being away? Yes, so Rob's away while she is, um, while they're living in the first little property. So right at the start of the story, um, she's running her beauty salon, Claudia goes to daycare and Rob does the fly in, fly out thing. And the reason I decided to put Rob in as fly in, fly out is because I have a few friends and I have a cousin whose husband is fly in, fly out. And I would hear these different stories from them about, um, I guess, the stresses that that would place on the relationship and that whole transition period when the husband's back in the house for his two or four weeks off um, and then readjusting to that new normal each and every time and sleep routines uh, being unsettled by that whole lifestyle. So I, I wanted to put that in. And for me also, it made it that, um, you know, there were gaps in the relationship between Angie and Rob that, yes, they've got a daughter together, Yes, they live together, but really they only see each other a small portion of the time. That's right. And um, the fly-in, fly-out industry, um, for every man or woman that's that's doing the fly-in, fly-out, um, the partner back at home is has to be just as strong as them to keep the home fires burning. So it's um, an interesting thing because they fly in, fly out, they go away and then come home and they, you know, they need their downtime as well. But the person that's back on the, on the farm, as Angie might be, might be wanting to say, here, I just need my time out. So um, I can see that you've set a, a few little uh, fires there for them. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. And another thing was that um, a fair bit of the mindsight stuff uh, got edited out as well. So that was right at the start of the story. I'd put in, um, you know, scenes from Rob being over in Western Australia and um, coming back home. But, you know, in, in the process of editing a book, a lot of the different things kind of get the cut. And that was one of them that I didn't get to spend as much time in the actual book talking about um, his life outside of his family. Because I thought that was quite an interesting little dynamic to, to have. And you know about that too, Jane. I do, I do. But um, I'm thinking even if it's been edited out this time, you can always park it and. Um, bring it back in in one of your, your next novels, perhaps. Um, let's move on and talk about his parents. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think that, um, that the mother-in-law, daughter-in-law dynamic is always ripe 
with drama. I also feel like um, relationships between, um, you know, the male spouse and his father-in-law can also be quite strained. So for this particular book, I started writing Rob and instantly with Rob came attached, his mother. Um, and Rosa was a lot of fun to write. I really enjoyed um, writing Rosa because she's, I guess, the culmination of every single enthusiastic grandmother that I know. And I know plenty of wonderfully enthusiastic grandmothers. Um, my mum is a very active, hands-on grandma. My beautiful neighbour who lives next door um, is also, you know, Anything that needs doing, she will be happy to do it. She, um, you know, pitches in where it's needed. She'll take around uh, baked goods, help out with childcare at the drop of a hat. Um, and then I can think of lots of other different grandmothers that also tread that fine line of, am I intruding? Am I doing too much? And then, of course, there's the other end of the spectrum, the, the grandparents that are not involved at all and don't want to be. So I thought I'd have a little bit of fun with that. And... It wasn't until I started writing the story that Rosa kind of jumped out at me as a character who said, hold on, me, me, look right about me. So I started writing some scenes from Rosa's point of view and I hadn't done that in Wildfire Ridge. It was strictly from the two main characters. But for Bottle Brush Creek, I thought, no, okay, Rosa wants to be heard. Let's give her a head and see where she goes. And, and she was a lot of fun. I've had some people... Um, say they felt very sorry for Rosa. I've had other people say they felt very sorry for Angie um, and sympathised with her. I think it depends on which um, age scale you're at as well because if you're my age and you've got young children, um, you're more likely to sympathise with Angie whereas um, people that are that little bit older that have grandchildren can, uh, you know, maybe read it and go, oh, poor Rosa, she got the raw end of the deal because she was so enthusiastic and just wanted to help. That's great. Um, it's good to have um, a little mixture in there and it's um, a bit about interpretation. Last week, I think we had Imbi Nimi talking about her book, The Spill, and that was about um, a car accident that was the mother and the two daughters were in. And the book actually follows years forward but the two sisters' interpretation of the same event and how they both have such varying opinions on and interpretations on how and why. So um, that might also explain a little bit about um, Angie and Rosa in they each have uh, their own interpretations of the same circumstances. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, communication, when, when it starts to break down, the littlest things can kind of set you off. And of course, you know, with a renovation, there's lots of important communication that needs to happen between, um, you know, between the two main people building the house. And it's not always necessarily conducive to a very happy, cosy relationship. Yes. Um, moving on to the renovation of this, this property, um, you've mentioned that the tradies are, are a factor in that. Um, and the, an interesting point would be trying to renovate it as a couple, but Rob being the FIFO worker is not there. So ultimately the decisions would be coming down to Angie, a lot of them, and having to deal well, with the tradies. Yes, yeah, so I did, um, I, I had Rob receiving retrenchment relatively early in the book, so he was um, on, on hand for at the build, but then of course, because he has his own business as well, so he steps away from the mine job relatively early, and they do um, decide that this is going to be the thing that they're going to bring them together and put their energy into it and a fresh, fresh start for both of them. But Angie does find that, you know, she's there by herself when the building inspector comes because Rob might be off with his motorbikes. I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> he might be elsewhere. He may be elsewhere. Um, but there's certainly plenty of times where um, Angie realises that the decisions fall to her. And, and then also on the opposite side of the coin, when Rob will make a decision on her behalf, that's not necessarily something she's happy with because, you know, you've got the budget issues, you've got timeline issues. And then you've got the assumption of some of the different tradesmen that maybe they don't need to ask Angie's opinion. So I had some interesting time kind of factoring in the treatment of women on non-traditional work sites. So, 
you know, we know about the Me Too movement, obviously, for people in offices with, you know, water cooler inappropriate discussions. But what about the more relaxed versions when you're on a building site and someone's doing the wrong thing? It's, um, it, there's a pretty bumpy path there, I think, for a lot of people. Yeah. And so um, do you want to just expand a bit on your research um, tactics, I suppose, in um, putting together Bottle Brush Creek? Yeah, definitely. So um, I guess one of the things that I like to do is I like to write what I know. So because I live in a rural area, it's, it's a really good fit for me to write rural romance. Um, we took on a major building project ourselves here at Narrawong and before then we renovated our first house together. And there were lots of different things in there that, I, that kind of would get my goat. And I think, well, why would, why would we do it like that? Why wouldn't we do it, say, this way? And a couple of times I thought to myself, well, I can see why some marriages don't survive renovations because they're very stressful and, you know, little things can easily snowball into big things. And so I wanted to, I wanted to look at that. I also had quite a few friends who were also owner builders and they had said to me about the different um, companies that they would speak to who would say, oh, can you put your husband on? I just, I need to talk to your husband about this. And, you know, my friends who are very capable would say, well, actually, you know, I've put just as much money towards this building project. You can talk to me. I know exactly where that delivery needs to go when you're going to drop it off. So tell me and I'll be there at that certain time. Yeah. Uh, so that was interesting. And then a few other different storylines. I spoke to a chap from um, Federation University in Ballarat about a feral animal element to the story. And that was based on some incidents here in the scrub at Tirandara that, uh, that had been happening, that had been, um, I guess, distressing some local farmers here. So I wanted to capture a little bit of that, but I wanted to make sure it was factual um, and not just based on hearsay. So I spoke to a really nice chap, Alastair Harkness, um, in Ballarat. Then, because I've got the dairy farming theme, and, and I put that in because when I was in primary school and high school, one of my best friends... Her parents had a dairy farm and weekends when I'd go over for a sleepover, it wouldn't be, would you like to come and help at the dairy? It'd be like, Kim, it's your turn to be on dairy duty this morning. So come on, get up, hurry up. You can get the calves in or you can go and feed the calves or you can help shift irrigation. So I learned how to drive in their paddocks, shifting irrigation pipes and feeding out hay. I'd also, um, you know, have a lot of respect for someone who's going to go in day in, day out and do that work because it is. It's all weather. It's, um, you know, it's a very committed lifestyle you need to have. And I wanted to highlight that. I wanted to shine a spotlight on, you know, the people that are up there at 4 a.m. getting milk on our tables. So my knowledge of being in the dairy was a little bit rusty because it had been quite a few years since I'd been helping out. And it turns out there's a lot of different electronic mod cons that have come into place since then. So I've got a great friend who lives at Tirandara that has a dairy farm and her kids went to school with my kids and she was more than happy to... Um, read through my dairy scenes and just say, oh, no, we actually have um, electronic cup removers that will do that. So, you know, you don't need to have that in that detail because we don't do that anymore. Uh, so that was really handy. And then in terms of um, the volunteer commitments, um, I've had a bit of experience with different volunteer commitments myself. So I kind of channeled some of the different things um, and different experiences that my friends have been through in trying to get themselves out of different committees once they've signed up, it's almost like you need to sign, fake your own death to, um, to actually get out of some committees. And it's funny because um, I had the Dahlia Society as the, one of the different committees that Angie gets roped into. And I said in there, I have a comment where one of the characters says, you'll need to fake your own death. And then lo and behold, I had this wonderful message from a lady who is the treasurer of the Victorian Dahlia Society who had read the book because I'd talked about my dahlias and how I've incorporated dahlias into this book. Um, so she picked up a copy of the book, she'd read it, and she wrote to me saying, you won't believe it, but I'm treasurer and I've been trying to get out of my duties for a little while now because of health issues or um, family needs. She said, so she laughed up a storm, screenshotted the page, sent it to all her friends on the committee and they all had a really good laugh thinking about <laughs> making her own death to get off her daily committee. I wonder if she submitted her resignation with the screenshot. <laughs> <laughs> Look, that would be a very novel way to do it and I would be so delighted 
connected. <laughs> yeah. Very modern. It. Very. It, it's um yeah, it just shows um that it's it's the whole package of, you know, the rural lifestyle. It you can't just be on your little property and in your own little bubble, even if you want to that sense of community is coming at you whether you want it or not <laughs> it is absolutely yeah oh that is just um great i've just got some questions coming through here um i was going to save them till later but i'm just going to ask this one and um, this is from vicky and she does ask hi maya looking forward to getting stuck into your new book are you able to give us some insight into your writing routine Oh, thank you, Vicky. That's great. Um, yes, so I certainly can. Um, I like to write in the morning. That's my best time. I'm not a night out at all. So um, I get the kids off to school and then I have my hot cup of tea ready. If I'm sitting at the computer at nine o'clock, then I know I'm going to have a good day. If I'm all ready and the washing's hung out, I've got the dishes done, the kids are at school, I'm set. So I like to sit down um, and write. For each different manuscript, I've had a, a slightly different routine. So when I was writing um, Wildflower Ridge, I was, uh, we, were we, were, we were building this house here. So I only had a good couple of hours in the evenings to write. And I did that. And I'm really happy now that I have a very nice office, um, which is quiet during daytime hours. So I can write quite happily um, at my desk. And I was keen on complete silence when I was writing the first book. I needed to have no distractions. So I put on these fantastic noise cancelling headphones and blocked out all sounds, everything around me. And then when I came to write book number two, I thought, let's change it up a little bit. I think I've got a slight idea of, of what I'm doing here. So perhaps what I'll do is I will um, listen to some music. So I chose a playlist just on Spotify. It wasn't music that I would normally listen to, but... For some reason, you know, the name of the playlist grabbed me. It's called Morning Motivation. And I think at that time I was, you know, struggling to get the story down. I, I wasn't quite clear exactly how it went. So I had this music on. And as soon as I put those headphones on and listened to that particular playlist, that was it. I was in the zone. There we go. I'm writing. And off and away. Um, though I do feel like maybe that led me down some garden paths because, um, you know, I did have to chop up. 30,000 words out of that book <laughs> out of the draft and then rewrite you know other sections as well so I think I got a little bit distracted with that music um, and then when I'm I'm currently working on book number three which is contracted to come out next winter with Alan Unwin and I'm listening to classical so it, it changes up a little bit what I'm listening to but I've always got cup of tea on constant standby. So I'm like chain drinking cups of tea and my exercise for the day is going up and down the staircase between the kitchen and my desk. Um, so at least I get a little bit of exercise um, during the day up and down those stairs to get my cups of tea. And then in the afternoons is usually when I schedule things like um, updating my website. I write a blog every month for Romance Writers Australia. So I get to interview a fantastic author every month and read their book and review their book. And then I also have a newsletter that I do that goes out once a month. And so in there, I have behind the scenes information about um, what I'm doing, what I'm working on, um, some of the lovely reader feedback and updates on, on any important news and events that are coming up. So that's usually something that I work on in the afternoons as well as the different social media sites that um, I'm on. And it seems like the day just goes like that. It, you know, evaporates before I know it. It's, it's three o'clock and I need to go pick up the children from school. Wow, we um we we talked about Angie's time management, but I'm I'm thinking that um she might be modelled just a little bit on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned um you do um your blog and book reviews. Uh, what are you reading at the moment? Yeah, look, I've always got a good book on the go. Um, and just two nights ago, I finished Barbara Hannay's new one. Now, I only came to know Barbara through blogging for Romance Writers Australia. So she was one of my early guests back in 2018 when I first started the blog. And she's based in Queensland in Townsville and she writes beautifully. So I've just, this is a new one that comes out in August and I've actually got a giveaway coming up in my August newsletter for subscribers um, to give away a copy of the book. And I really enjoyed it. She does a great job. Um, there's a little bit of romance in there. It's like a family 
um, saga going on behind it and, and highly recommend that one. So that one's coming out uh, August the 4th. And then tonight when I go to bed, because that's when I do my favourite um, favorite reading is a couple of chapters every night before I go to bed, I'm about to start Alison Stewart's new book. Now, this one's called The Gold Miner's Sister. And her first book came out last year, and that was The Postmistress. Uh, yeah, The Postmistress. So it's historical. It's Australian. Alison is based in Melbourne. So she's in lockdown at the moment and having a pretty tough time of it because she has an elderly mother as well who's quite ill. So um, I'm really looking forward to that. That just came out with Harlequin uh, this month, I believe. And, and it's going to be a good read. So I'm really lucky that I get um, these fantastic books to review and publishers you know, send them across to me and I have a wow of a time. Most of my reading is Australian and I'm very pleased with that. Yeah, that is great. Thank you for sharing those. We'll all have to add them to our list and start reserving them at the library or getting out into the bookshops and um, grabbing a copy and supporting our Australian writers, especially those that are in lockdown. Um, yourself, have with the, the whole COVID thing, how's have you been able to get out and about to do some promotion or is it pretty much been Zoom? Yeah, it has, Jane, mostly been Zoom. Um, and there have been some really great benefits of that in that, um, you know, people can tune in from wherever they are across Australia. They can tune in their pyjamas. They don't have to get doled out. They don't have to go out on a freezing cold winter's night to, uh, to their local library or bookshop. So there's been some advantages. There's also been some disadvantages because I love nothing more than, um, you know, talking to people about books and about writing. So that's a little bit of downside. I don't get to meet um, the readers or people who are aspiring writers that come along to author talks or the lovely booksellers or librarians. Um, I don't get to, you know, have that quite same connection. Um, but I think, I think we're really lucky in that we can do all this Zoom, um, these Zoom events. It's, it's very fortunate and I'd love to give a big shout out to our local bookstores as well. We've got some really great support um, in Collins Books in Warrnambool. McKaylee and her team there do a wonderful job. They yes. were at quite a few of my different events last year um, selling books and they still have some signed copies in store as well. So if you haven't got a copy yet, you can either reserve it from the library or you can pop in there. Um, jo at Blarney Books in Port Ferry has been another fantastic supporter. So they've um, shut their doors during lockdown, but then they're doing some renovations as well and they'll be opening up bigger and better um, coming soon and they can still take orders as well. So it's, um, we're very lucky here. Excellent. That's wonderful. Um, yeah, I, yeah, Zoom, thank goodness. I think the whole of, the, not just the country, the world is, is actually, you know, working with this Zoom technology and thinking, you know, how would we have got, and done half of the things we've done without this. So um, thank you, Zoom. <laughs> um, I've just seen a, another comment that's just come through from Joe, and it's, uh, hi, Maya, I'm camping on the banks of the Murray listening to you. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. See, look at that. You wouldn't be able to do that uh, in pre-COVID times. That's wonderful, Joe. Uh, have a nice champagne on the river for me. <laughs> yes, yes, I bet you we all wish we were there at the moment. Now, um, going sideways a little bit, and then we'll come back to the book. Um, your beautiful earrings. Now, you tell me you've been um, doing a collaboration with um, Shauna at Dollhouse Earrings. Tell everybody about this. Yeah, look, Jane, I was so delighted. Um, I was listening to a different podcast and they were talking about women in business and collaborations and I hadn't really thought too much about it but of course you know a lot of the big brands collaborate with other brands and you know you kind of um, you're stronger together and so I thought to myself well who could I collaborate with and I'd met um, the very lovely Stacey from the Human Library last year at your lovely library and we'll talk about that a little bit later but she had these amazing earrings on and she was always wearing these great earrings every time I'd see her she'd have a different pair and so I messaged her and I said where do you get your gorgeous earrings from and she said oh they're from Dollhouse Jewelry she's a warmable based lady she makes these amazing earrings all by herself very artistic um, and she sells them online so of course straight away I went and I had a look I bought myself some pairs and wore them very proudly and when I had this idea for collaboration, I thought, well, 
a local artist. That would be someone who would be perfect to collaborate with. And she, um, I got in touch with Shauna and said, look, would there be any chance at all that you'd be interested in designing a range of earrings, especially for the launch of Bottle Brush Creek? And she said, heck yes, I'm, I'm all ears. And so she was a delight to work with. Um, there were several different ones, uh, variations of this. There's some dangly ones. And I bought myself a few pairs. I bought some pairs to use for giveaways um, in promoting the book. And they were so popular. Jane, the amount of people that got in touch with me to say, oh, I really want to win those earrings because I had a, you know, a copy of Bottle Brush Creek with a copy of the Bottle Brush Creek collaboration earrings. And it was just such a lovely little relationship to be able to you know, working with someone else who's working from home um, and giving it their best shot. So it was a really nice relationship. And, you know, I couldn't help myself. I went into Portland to get some groceries um, on the weekend, slipped out without the kids, which is always a nice little treat, and just happened to wander past um, a, a shop in Portland that stocks here earrings. And I'm not sure how it happened, but another three pairs might have fallen into my shopping basket while I was there. And I figured it was a great way to celebrate making the top 10 bestseller list for June. So that was my little celebration to myself. Yes. Um, and I want to go there and, and talk about that. So where can our listeners get hold of your earrings before we move on to that? Um... Oh, yes. Yes. So Shauna is online. She has her own um, website. She has an Instagram site. It's Dollhouse Jewelry. And uh, she's very easy to look up. If you can't find her, have a look on my site because um, I've often got links to different um, people that I enjoy and support. So, you know, I, if you send me a message, if you can't find her, I'll shoot you in the right direction. Excellent. Um, now, you just mentioned um, Better Reading Top 100. Do you want to tell us about that? And just, I think I saw in your Facebook in the last week, you were announced in the Australian Top 10 Fiction Books for June. Is that correct? That's right, Jane. And my smile couldn't get much bigger because I was so delighted. Um, as, you know, a, a country girl who lives just here in Southwest Victoria, um, who's decided to have a crack at writing a book, to make those type of lists just... Um, is everything I could have hoped for, really. So I guess we'll start with the Better Reading Top 100. Um, see how we've got the little mini version of Wildflower Ridge and we've got the big version of Bottle Brush Creek. This little mini version was printed, they call it the B format, and they printed this and it's on the shelves in Big W for the next 12 months because it made that Better Reading Top 100. It made number 79 um, out of all the books. So there was, you know, books like To Kill a Mockingbird and stuff. People could, were not bound by the year that the book was released. They could vote for any old book by, you know, overseas authors, not just Australia, but it was all voted by um, Australian readers. And that was a really big coup because, yeah, as I said, the little version stays on the shelves for 12 months as opposed to at Big W, they often just buy a box, sell a box, never stock it again. Um, unlike our independent bookstores, if a book sells well, they'll get it back in. Um, so that, that was really exciting. That was um, earlier this year that I had that success. And then to find out that um, Bottle Brush Creek had made the Australian fiction charts uh, was just sensational because, you know, that is, that's for books that are sold by Australian authors in the month of June. So there's still got Trent Dalton, who had Boy Swallows Universe, incredibly successful. Um, and plenty of really popular books that have been out for a while are still selling very, very well. Um, but for Bottle Brush Creek to make it onto that list just was wonderful. So I, I feel very, very treasured, uh, very lucky that people have been so supportive of the book and, and got their hands on a copy and recommended it to friends and asked their libraries to buy it in. That's fantastic. Um, so when you found out um, that you had been in that Better Reading Top 100, and most recently, the top 10 Australian fiction for June. Where were you? What were you doing? And then what was your reaction? Well, it's, um, it's one of those things that you go, <gasps> and your heart kind of stops for a couple of minutes, a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds. Your heart skips a beat because all of a sudden, it's not just you thinking, oh, well, I think the story's okay. You know, it's, um, I've put my heart and soul and a couple of years into writing it. It's other people saying, we love what you've written. We love the way that you tell stories. Um, so it's, it's a real recognition for 
um, I guess that the, the effort that you put in, you don't know if it's going to be well received. So I was at my desk when I received the news for both of those times. Um, and, and the first thing I do, of course, is, is I call my husband. I say, oh, Chase, guess what's happened? And, and tell him the wonderful news. And then straight to mum. Mum's the next person that I call. Yeah. Um, and then my brothers and my sister get the text message to tell them. But um, it's, it's really nice to be able to share that type of news um, and to have other people, you know, really excited and backing you all the way as well is, is very special. Oh, that's fantastic. And I'm sure there's going to be um, plenty more coming your way with... Um that sort of recognition. Um, you mentioned the human library. Uh, just um, expand a little bit on the human, your, your experience with the Warrnambool Library, Human Library. Uh, some of our listeners may not be up to speed with what I, actually that was. Yeah, so that was a fantastic initiative, Jane. Um, last year it took place, um, Matt Reeves and Jodie Fleming um, uh, local celebrities in Waterball and they do a lot for the community and one of the ideas that they had was wouldn't it be fantastic if we had this human library where people can come into the library and check out humans instead of checking out books and reading up on a different fact so it was kind of based on the concept of that um, TV show on ABC called You Can't Ask That where they'll have the special guests in about you know Maybe they'll have um, people that worked in the military or maybe they'll have people with Down syndrome or maybe they'll have people who, you know, enjoy um, some s and um, like, you know, different things like that. Um, but obviously we didn't have people quite of those different scales at our local human library. We had people like romance authors like myself talking about the life and times of a romance author. We had um, people who had dealt with mental illness. We had people who had been um, returned from the army. We had um, people that were transgender, had people that had um, worked in these amazing fields and inspirational stories and dealing with these great circumstances. So I was so thrilled to be invited along. And that was October, I believe, September or October. And last year, and they're looking at doing it again this year, obviously COVID's thrown a spanner in the works there. But um, it, was, it was really lovely. And we had, I think it was the record number of people through the Warnable Library doors ever on the day that we held the human library. And people would borrow these human books for 15 minutes and then a bell would ring when each person's time was up. But it was, um, it was a really neat experience and great to be a part of. It won a huge Australia Day Award as well for the Community Initiative of the Year. So really proud to make some new friends through that and, and share in the journey. It, it was a fantastic um, initiative. Um, and that group, um, I think the networks that have grown just from the participants that were the guest speakers from that has has been a great thing as well and um, again you know that community thread which is is fantastic um, I'm glad that you got so much out of it it was a very special and it was a very different experience <laughs> as she said that bell was ringing it's like okay time to return your book your human book <laughs> and go and see another human book but to actually um, speak one-on-one -on -one with um, those people on their special, specialist topics. Um, hopefully we get to do that opportunity. It, it may be in another format, it might be Zoom. Um, but yeah, definitely um, a great um, community initiative bringing so many different people together in such a large and intense way that wouldn't usually happen. It, I was there, it was wall to wall. Um, so yes, it might be on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to see. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your cooking? Because um, I know that Angie's a bit of a cook as well, but yourself, I've seen some amazing things on your Facebook page. Oh, thank you, Jane. Look, I, I love having a crack. Um, I'll have a go at just about anything. So um, when the kids say, what's for dessert, Mum? I'll go, oh, okay, well, what do I feel like? Make? Oh, yeah, we've got heaps of rhubarb in the garden. Today, it's a rhubarb pie, but not just any old rhubarb pie. It'll be, you know, tirandara apples from our friend's orchard. 
It would be our own rhubarb that we've grown and let's, let's make it a little bit different. We'll make our own pastry and let's do a bit of a geometric design at the top. So we have a lot of fun in the kitchen. Um, definitely there's not a week that goes by when someone's not baked something. So I've um, been teaching the kids to make different things. My daughter makes this wonderful coconut cake and she can make it all by herself. Um, she's not so happy on the whole putting things into the hot oven, but um, she made this really lovely little um, YouTube tutorial on how to make this cake because the coconut cake actually features in Bottle Brush Creek, so it's a bit special. Um, and she's done this tutorial, which is on my website as well. Um, we also love doing um, roasts because we've got um, our own, a freezer full of our own beef. And you know, before that, we had a freezer full of our own pork when we had pigs. So there's all these great things that we like to have a go at. And we've got 20 chickens at the moment. So we're getting about 13 eggs a day. And there's a lot of eggs that need to be baked into something. So there's always a, a great excuse for cooking around here. And we also like to bake for the show. So last year I entered the Port Fairy show for the first time and came away with a few blue ribbons, which is really nice. Uh, and the Tirandara show is one of our favourites. So every year we... Um, get all excited as a family. My husband enters the, the bloke's chocolate cake and the bloke's scones. And this year he did this um, fantastic display for the bread section. And I will make oh, about a dozen different things. So whether it's sponge cakes, whether it's yo-yo biscuits or jam drops or the favorite cake section, that's one of my favorite little things to enter because you can you know, do whatever type of cake you want. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun getting involved in cooking and, and a bit of um, friendly rivalry with the neighbors as well. Uh, challenges on. I, I know um, my parents, they have a, a, a small property, very small property, but um, they have their own challenge of, you know, who grows the biggest tomatoes, who has the <laughs> most pounds of produce at the end of summer. So they have this like running tally just between mum and dad. They've got their own little sections. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. We might have to start that. Our tomato crop was wonderful this year. It was late, but we were still getting, you know, at some stages we were getting five, uh, yeah, like a bucket of tomatoes, a big couple of kilo bucket of tomatoes a day. So we had, um, we've still got frozen tomatoes in the freezer because I like to just quarter them, whack them in a Ziploc bag, whack them in the freezer. Um, so we have free, uh, frozen tomatoes for, for months. It's wonderful. Yes, you might have to start your own um, produce challenge. <laughs> um, Maybe. Yeah, you were talking la, la, all things local and um, I just want to zip back to Bottle Brush Creek. Um, and do you want to just expand a bit on the Tower Hill setting in the portion of the book? Yeah, so one of the things that I've been able to do with um, my different books is, is put in the little points of interest, things that are special to me, things that are special to my friends and family. And then because we live here on, in Southwest Victoria, why not give our region a good plug? So I talk about, um, you know, the Tower Hill is a little spot that Rob likes to go to escape, um, to, you know, clear his head, to think things through. So I've got a couple of different scenes at Tower Hill where he's looking out over those beautiful craters. Um, I've got talking about the, you know, Codrington electricians and the Allensford um, place. They went and had a look at a renovated delight over there. So it's really nice to be able to thread those things in. Um, and, and local people who have read the book, my friends in Portland, some of my friends in, in Waterville and Port Ferry, have said they've just loved that little aspect. Reading a book that's actually got their hometown, their own local geography in it is just it's really nice so it doesn't matter someone who's in New South Wales you know they're not going to be offended by the fact that I've got Codrington and Tower Hill and Coroit in there but people who are who are local and know these areas they just love it so it's really special to be able to put those in yes. and uh, hopefully there's a lot of landmarks that people recognize when they read it they will they will so they will absolutely have to get into Collins and grab a copy um, you said that there's um, signed copies there that they can still purchase um the library is open i'm not sure if with all this going on some people may not know but yes we are open um we can do reservations uh mayor's uh, books are on high rotation at the moment but um you can ring us up or um go online and, and reserve copies and um, we'll get them out to you as soon as um they become available but yeah definitely do that um, I was just 
shuffling through my notes again here. Um, social media. So um, you've got Facebook, Instagram, you've got a website, you do a blog. My goodness. Um, do you want to expand a bit on your, mm, your writing? What now? Obviously, you're writing your third book. You've started here. Um, it says you're a former country journalist and PR writing. So I suppose the first big question is, when did you make that decision? I'm going to write a book. <laughs> um, so Jane, I, I'd always wanted to write a book. It was always my dream to become an author, but I kind of shelved that along the way and thought, well, I don't know anyone who's written a book. Um, it's a little bit audacious of me to say, I'm going to write a book and, and make that my lifelong career um, without getting some, some grounding you know, beneath me. So I went into journalism, had a lovely time with journalism, went into public relations and doing the media and communications for the Northern Grampians Shire when we were living up in Stall. And um, then some contract PR for a, a fantastic firm in Port Ferry, O2 Media. And um, Karen Foster, who runs O2 Media, is actually just um, running for council. So it's a bit exciting to see her doing great things as well. But then I thought when we'd almost finished building our home, my youngest child was in kindergarten, not far away from being in school. I thought, well, I'd better actually, um, you know, work out what I'm going to do. Am I going to go back to work in newspapers? Am I going to, you know, look for a local government job or do contract PR work again? And that's when it, uh, I decided to tell my husband that I'd always dreamed of writing this book. And he said, well, perhaps give it a shot. So I did. And, and that went well. Um, with Wildflower Ridge. So I was quite lucky to be picked up. Um, Alan and Unwin have been a fantastic publisher to work for. They've just celebrated 30 years um, of being a top Australian publisher. So, you know, it's been a really dream run to work with them um, and to tell the stories of um, rural Australia. That, that is just amazing. Did you have to send out your manuscript far and wide or did you just Google a couple of places and say, I'll send that off? What did you do? Uh, I was really lucky in that my manuscript was picked up really early. Um, so the only people who'd seen my manuscript was, there was an agent, there was a publisher from a different publishing house and the publisher who I went with, Alan Unwin. Um, Annette Barlow is a wonderful lady who took my book, saw the vision of what it could be and ran with it and offered me a publishing contract. So, um, you know, for me that worked out really well. I couldn't have been in better hands. Um, and I do have a few different articles that I've talked about um, how I got that publishing contract um, on my website. They're linked there. So if anyone's interested, I go into a bit further detail um, in a talk that I did with Brisbane Libraries last week. Um, we went right down to the nitty gritty of how it all happened. So that's a quite a good little one um, for the technical detail if there's any aspiring writers out there. Okay. So um, do you want to, while we're talking about, um, linking up with some of your pages, just um, let our listeners know where they can um, track you down online. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I have an Instagram account and it's maya.linnell.writes. And I also have a Facebook account. I've got an author page, which is maya.linnell.writes. And I also have a personal profile as well, which, you know, I try and spread my um, Instagram photos across to that author page. Uh, and I love taking photos. So there's regularly, um, there's cute lambs on there. There's a little bit about my writing. I've been um, sharing some photos from my garden, um, doing some flashbacks to when the dahlias were all in bloom and the roses were all in bloom. Um, but at the moment, you know, we're doing okay. We've got jonquils, we've got wallflowers, um, the happy wanderer is looking beautiful and purple at the moment. So we've got, um, there's always a bit of gardening, always a bit of baking. Um, and a little bit of background on my writing, plus the, the beautiful um, country living that we do out here um, at our property. And then I have a website as well. So that's uh, just www.mayalanel.com and you'll be able to find quite a few of my different um, interviews that I've done with the different authors for romance writers. Um, the newsletter that goes out once a month. So, you know, feel free to subscribe and um, hang out there with me. That'd be great. I've got giveaways most months. Um, and also lots of information about, um, I guess, how I got to where I am. 
That's fantastic. Um, I'm just looking here. Uh, we're also um, going to, we're recording this. So if anybody wants to listen back, we'll actually publish that um, onto our YouTube page with a link from our Facebook page. So keep a listen out on the Mortable Library Facebook page in a couple of days and we can, anyone can listen back and grab all those details as well. And I was just going to look at my next thing. Questions, okay. We're nearly hitting the 8.30 mark. My goodness, you've done so well. Do you need a sip of water or anything? <laughs> I'm going okay for now. Okay, well, we've just got a few questions and then we might wrap it up um, for you so you can get stuck back into your book. Um, okay, now, you may um, know what this is about. Sue has messaged and says, I Googled the use of Jack's biscuits as opposed to Savoy's used in your Victoria, and then it stops. Does that okay. Happen? So I, I'm guessing that um, maybe in the other states we don't, you don't have Savoy's. So we've got, I know that when I, because I'm from South Australia originally, and I'd never heard of the word Savoy's before, but um, it's interesting because some of the different terms that I'll use um, with the different sayings are not necessarily widespread. So sometimes my editor, when she's reading through um, my manuscript, she will say, hold on, Maya, what are we talking about here? What is blah, 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 what's a counter meal? And I said, oh, you don't know what a counter meal? Everyone knows what a counter meal is. Yes. But, um, you know, I thought everyone knew, but uh, as it turns out, if you live in metropolitan Sydney, you may not know what a counter meal is or um, different people call things different names, but it's not until my book goes to a different editor and then it goes to another one after that. So it goes through a few different stages in the process of um, becoming a polished book that goes out on the shelves. And it's been really funny, the different discussions, um, even the word skittle. So, you know, if your dog runs out in the road, you say, oh, the dog got skittled. Well, <laughs> that's not necessarily an Australia-wide term. Um, so I had to do a bit of a pop quiz with a few of these things to say to friends, would you know what I said if something got skittled? And I'll send it to a friend in Queensland, I'll send it to a friend that I know in Darwin, I'll send it to a couple of local friends and someone in South Australia too. Just so I'm kind of crossing all those bases um, when the editor waves a red flag and says, oh, I don't know if that's a Victorian only term or maybe only a Southwest Victorian term. Um, but it's a lot of fun to see which things that, you know, I think are completely common knowledge uh, may not necessarily be. So, yes, Jats versus Savoy is a very interesting one. <laughs> yes, a bit like the, uh, the Warnable nibble pie. Apparently that's a Warnable Southwest thing. No one else knows what, what a nibble pie is. Is that like a little party pie, like yeah. the little one? Yeah, mm -hmm. I moved to Warnable and it's like they have nibble pies. What's a, what's a nibble pie? Nibble, nibble, little, just a little bite size. Um, okay, so there's another one here. Um, this is from Jan. Hi, Maya. Lovely to see you online tonight. I met you at the Human Library last year and went out and purchased your first book. It was a very memorable meeting. Thank you. It's fun to read books yet in our local area. Where will you set your next book? Oh, thank you, Jan. That's really lovely of you. Um, I have got the next book is set back in Bridgefield, which is where um, Wildflower Ridge is set. So it's at the foot of the Grampians. I haven't got a specific um, town that I've that I've called Bridgefield, but it's that kind of area, um, you know, near Eden Hope, north of Eden Hope, just that beautiful area where you can see the Grampians, um, and and you've got those beautiful rolling green hills. So kind of Harrow. Um, Balmoral, Cavendish type of way. So it's it's quite a nice spot because we used to live at Stall and the house that we lived in had a beautiful view of the Grampian from the deck. So that was my natural choice for where to set the book first. Yeah, oh, that's fantastic. So we've hit the 8.30 um, mark, Maya. So what I might do is thank you and wrap it up and I'll get you to stay online when everyone else um, taps out just so that you and I can finish off. So firstly, officially, we would like to thank you on behalf of the Warnable Library for joining us tonight. It's been um, a fantastic insight into your writing career and uh, which is only going to get bigger and better, I'm sure, with um, much more kudos coming your way. 
Um, your first book, Wildflower Ridge, um, is obviously going great guns and Bottle Brush Creek, uh, hot off the press and going great guns as well. We've got lots of copies in the library, but if anybody um, can't get hold of one quick enough, get down into Collins Booksellers and support um, your local booksellers in Warrnambool or did you say Blarney Books in? Yep, Blarney Books in um, And if people are listening over the border in Mount Gambier, Collins Books in Mount Gambier also have, um, a, you know, a fantastic range of books there too. So they're very, very good supporters too. Yes, well, hopefully sooner rather than later, we'll all be able to meet in person and do live in-person um, online, uh, book, sorry, not online, author talks in person. And um, fingers crossed that we can do that for your next release. So um, I'm going to say thank you to everybody for joining and um, please um, get on board to the um, library website and you can do your reservations and you can ask us if you want uh, anything else that you think might be uh, something that you want to reserve we're just there to help you and uh, thank you very much for joining us i'll um ask you now to just uh tap out and i'll just finish off with maya so thank you everybody thank you everybody for tuning in it's been lovely chatting and don't forget to chase up those earrings <laughs> now what was that where do we get them dollhouse jewelry yes i'm intrigued i need some new ones <laughs> so everyone's